when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses. The parents of Jesus brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. It struck me that this passage in Luke, our gospel for today, or actually our gospel for February 2nd, but we moved it to today, is about not just the purification of Mary, the way that Luke tells it. He makes the point that Joseph comes with her. And Joseph isn't required to be there because it's not really his purification in the law of Moses. It has to do with women giving birth and questions of purification and all of that. And men have things they have to do for purification as well, but it doesn't have to do with this. So men have to do hard things to have a relationship with God in the Old Testament as well. Remember circumcision and other things like that. And they have to make sacrifices to atone for their sins. But this is specifically about a woman coming to the temple to present herself and be purified. And then to present her firstborn child to God. This is similar to what Hannah did with Samuel. She brought him to the temple and presented him to God. Of course, she was presenting him more strongly to God because she had promised him to the service of the temple. But every child, every firstborn male, has to go through this process of being designated as holy to the Lord. This practice probably is in Luke, because not because he's too concerned about the law. The law of Moses is actually not Luke's main concern in teaching about Jesus, but because it gets him to the temple where he meets the prophet Anna and Simeon, who isn't described as a prophet, but is described as a man who was in the temple. He may have worked in the temple. He may have been of the tribe of Levi and been one of the people taking care of things. That's certainly what is often assumed, that Simeon is of the priestly group. Anyway, Luke gets Jesus and Mary and Joseph to the temple so that we can see God coming close to Simeon and coming close to Anna in the Holy Spirit and showing them the Messiah so that we can see how you get to see the Messiah. You get to see the Messiah through several ways. You get to see the Messiah through the law of Moses through the teachings of the prophets, like Malachi, who is reminding us of the one who will come before him, which is John the Baptist, and what Jesus will do when he's here. So you get that, you see the Messiah there. And then you see the Messiah through your family, especially if you are the Messiah. <laughs> you see the Messiah through your family because they tell you the story of your birth and the story of who you are and the story of what you mean to God. So that's how you see the Messiah. And then you see the Messiah in other people pointing him out. And so this is in some ways a microcosm of what evangelism is. How you come to know Jesus, how you come to identify with Jesus, and how you come to share about Jesus. So this is an important story for Luke because he is concerned with evangelization of people who wouldn't necessarily know about the law of Moses. So he teaches us about the law of Moses and gives us a background about how every firstborn male is holy. For people who didn't live under the covenant of Israel, they would have needed to know that. Why are these people showing up? Why are they giving turtle doves? Where does this come from? For people who are not steeped in the tradition of the covenant of God and the people of Israel, that would be necessary information. And it's necessary information for us because though we are a part of God's covenant, we do not directly through our families and through our culture inherit the law of Moses. We always have to deal with it. That's why Paul writes about it so much. That's why we have so many uh, people who struggle with the question of if God has told us how to be righteous and we fail at being righteous, why does God let that happen? 
what is the point of the law of Moses? What is the point of dealing with sin and purification? If God wants us to know that God loves us, no matter what, and that we are created good, why do we have so many stories about the people breaking the rules? This story of Mary and Joseph humbly going to the temple, which would have been pretty far away from them, they would have had to go to Jerusalem. It would not have been just, let's go down Conestoga Road or let's go down King of Prussia Road to our local church and get our baby baptized. They would have had to make a long journey to make this sacrifice. There was only one place where they could go to be close to God in that way. So they went to Jerusalem because it was their duty as devout and righteous Jews, because Jesus is no different than any of the other little Jewish boys, and he has to be designated holy to the Lord, because he's no different than Isaac, because he's no different than any other young man, than Samuel or the other little boys who were participating in this long line of children devoted to God. They had to do this because it was both a family obligation and a tribal obligation and an obligation to God. But I don't think it's just that. I think that their bringing Jesus to the temple in this way also provided for Simeon and Anna the opportunity to do what they were supposed to do. The Holy Spirit is described as resting on Simeon and revealing to him what will happen when he waits for the Messiah. That he, waiting and being present in the temple, will eventually see the Messiah because eventually a little boy will come and a little boy will be revealed to him as both the same as all the other little boys in Israel and very different. So Simeon probably, if he worked in the temple, it would have been great because then he could have spent time there all the time and it would have been fine. But if he didn't, it would have represented a pretty strong commitment to be there every day, waiting, waiting for the Messiah. I know people who have that kind of commitment to their relationship with God, who show up every day to pray, who show up in the temple, who show up in their workplace, who show up every day to see the Messiah and to worship him. Because this boy is both, of course, an important and destined child destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, destined to really, really make the authorities mad, destined to be crucified with criminals. And all of that is in this prophecy. And yet, he is also like us. When we read the letter to the Hebrews, we are reminded that since we share God's children, that since we are God's children, and we are flesh and blood, Jesus has shared with us all the sufferings, all the things that we cannot, in good conscience, forget. He remembers the enslavement of African Americans. He remembers the wars that have been fought over territory and resources and land. He remembers the hatred of Christians for Jews and how that played out in the Holocaust and in many, many other ways, especially during the Middle Ages. He remembers and carries in his body all the things that we have done that are not pure. He remembers all the way back to Cain and Abel all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, created good, deceived, and then pointing the finger, 
at someone else. It's amazing how all this goes together in one person. Jesus is presented to all of us every day in the sufferings of other people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those of us who are being tested. It is not that we are responsible for all the suffering in the world and we have to cleanse it. We are not responsible for our own purification. That's the clarity of the law of Moses. You are not responsible for your own purification. You are to go to the place where God tells you to go and you are to reconcile with God. That is what you are to do. Jesus came because we weren't always able to do that. So God came to us to do the reconciliation. And then God gave to us who are Christians, who are followers of his way and his path, not just the duty, but the desire, the desire to be united with God and to be united with others. As we prepare ourselves for Lent, which is coming in two weeks, our purification ritual, our 40 days of journeying with Jesus and examining ourselves and examining our world and asking for God's will and asking for God's help in our purification. As we journey with Jesus all the way to the cross, all the way through the resurrection, and we present ourselves to God in the holy places, we will experience the transformation that is described in the prophet Malachi. And it will not always be comfortable. Experiencing the refiner's fire, we imagine is probably not comfortable. Experiencing being washed with fuller's soap, fuller's soap is a very harsh thing. It will not be always pleasant. It was not, I'm sure, pleasant for Adam and Eve, completely naked, to stand before God and say, yes, we did what you told us not to do, but we were deceived. It was not a pleasant experience, I don't imagine. The thing to remember about purification and sin, of course, is that it's not that we are fully corrupt, fully depraved, fully wretched in our being. It's that we belong to God, and we belong to each other, and we are responsible to God for each other. So when we are aware of the sufferings of the world and we feel it, it isn't really relevant whether we caused it. It isn't really relevant whether I personally caused some of the things that we know are wrong and have to be changed in our society. What's relevant is the God who is in relationship with me is calling me to be in relationship with other people to help to heal that suffering. That is the work of Christians. The Christian church is here for reconciliation. The Christian church is not here for us to sit and feel bad and soak in our depravity. It is here for us to preach the good news and say to people, yes, yes, there is suffering in the world. We have all experienced it. Some of us have experienced it more than others, and some of us have experienced it because of what we have done or what we have left undone. And yet, what we are called to be and do as Christians is not to worry so much about the suffering, but to worry about the relationship. Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to see Simeon and Anna, and what Simeon and Anna did was say, here you are, the Messiah, and we are given peace because you're here. And then, of course, to tell other people, they have seen the Messiah. He is here. He is here to help us. 
He is here because God cares enough to come to us even when we cannot bring ourselves to God. So if you are suffering from guilt about the way the world is, or if you are afraid to think about sin or talk about sin or talk about it at all, <laughs> because church isn't the place where you want to feel bad, I want you to know that it isn't about your feeling bad. It's about Jesus wanting to come near to you, to heal it, to give you your purpose in that process. The same way that Simeon's purpose in that process of God was simply to be there, to be present, to recognize the Messiah, the Christ, and to proclaim him. That is the role of the church. Every Christian person has to do that. Doing that means dealing with what happens when you meet Jesus. He looks at you. He loves you. And yes, he purifies and transforms you in a way that you might not expect, in a way that might not be comfortable, but in a way that God needs to have happen for the world to be regenerated. That is our purpose on this earth. And of course, when we die, some of those irreconcilable things, I believe, are reconciled. But while we are here, while we are alive, our purpose is to allow Jesus to transform us. Our purpose is to respond. Our purpose is to present ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice to God. So thank you for coming <laughs> to the holy place today to present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And as you go about your daily life, remember, remember to invite Jesus into it. Remember to see other people as the potential Messiah for you that day. And if you're worried about things that you didn't have anything to do with, but that make you feel bad, that's when it's okay to say to God, these things are, I know they're wrong. Help me, help me, and see what happens. I am sure the Holy Spirit will rest on you. I am sure you will have a revelation of Jesus. I am sure that you will give something to the world of knowing the Messiah and being united to him.